Hello, everyone. Good to be with you here tonight. Um, my name's Nick, um, Nick Couchman. Uh, by daytime, I am a Linux systems engineer slash team leader slash IT manager at uh, Coty, the cosmetics manufacturing conglomerate. Um, by night, I'm a contributor to the Guacamole Project, which is an open source uh, project through the Apache Software Foundation. And I have a feeling my slides are going to get cut off here, but we'll see. Um, so I've been doing ev everything Linux for about, I don't know, 15, 18 years now. Um, very much an open source fan uh, and a Linux fan. And, and uh, so during my day job, I try to convince a company that seems bent on running everything Microsoft to run a little more Linux, just a little bit more Linux. Um, I got into Guacamole a few years ago, um, into the project a few years ago. Uh, I was using, kind of using it in my in my job at that time and uh, ended up kind of starting to reach out to the community and got involved in it. I'm not a programmer by trade. I'm not a very good programmer at that when, you know, the remedial programming skills, that's, you know, that's me right there. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I do try to contribute to the project and, and uh, you know, make, make a difference, give back a little bit to an open source project where I can. Um, so Brian uh, pulled me into this, sucked me into this, and and uh, said, hey, I'm, I'm doing this presentation. You can come present guacamole. And, and uh, I agreed. So here we are. So um, what is guacamole, aside from a really yummy chip dip? Um, above all things, and, and this is something that I, I think a lot of people that come and start using the guacamole project don't understand, guacamole is a protocol. It's actually a protocol. So the, the guacamole project, and, and we'll We'll see it here um, in a minute when I describe kind of the, the different components of it, but it's really that the protocol that travels over HTTP and WebSockets is, is at the core of the Guacamole project. And it, uh, it translates between these uh, various remote desktop, common remote desktop protocols like SSH and RDP and VNC and Telnet and Kubernetes today, that's the list of them, um, to a web browser. So it's a it's a protocol, but it's also a clientless remote desktop gateway. So clientless, and, and the web page says this uh, kind of verbatim this way, clientless in our case means all you need is a web browser. There's no plugins, there's no applets, there's no software to install on your computer. As long as you get a web browser, you can access Guacamole. And, and that's one of the things that uh, really makes it powerful and, and uh, uh, attractive for uh, for especially cloud type solutions as, as the world tends to, to kind of head in that direction. Um, and then, and it's also a, a gateway of sorts. So, so there's some, when, when we get to see the client part of it, you'll see that there's some authentication built in and access control and, and connection, um, connection configuration, things that, that you'd expect to see in a, in a normal remote desktop uh, client. Um, the project was started back in the early 2000s by a couple guys. Michael Jumper is the name of one of them, and James Mueller is the other one. I, I, I don't want to misrepresent, but I think Mike was probably, it was probably his brainchild, and then James kind of got um, pulled in, was probably his friend or something at, at a college that I went to or something like that. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm shooting from the hip on that one. But um, it originally was developed on SourceForge. Uh, and then back in 2016, it shifted over to the Apache Software Foundation and uh, entered the incubator project in the Apache Software Foundation. So uh, I, I don't know how familiar everybody is with Apache, with, with the Apache Software Foundation, but uh, you know, obviously they've produced things like the HTTP um, server is, is the most famous one, Tomcat. Um, but they, when you want to bring your project into the Apache Software Foundation, you have to go into Incubator first and, and learn how to do things the Apache way, is what they call it. And so it, in 2016, Guacamole went into Incubator status and uh, graduated in late 2017, like December 2017, into an Apache top-level project. So it is a full-blown Apache uh, project at this point, licensed under the Apache 2.0 uh, license that licenses everything that, that is part of the Apache Software Foundation. Um, so quick history, not going back to the beginning, but just going back a couple years for um, versions of Guacamole. Um, so the incubating versions were, were when it was in the incubator status in, in Apache. So 0.9.12 um, has tabbed thumbnails and HTTP header authentication, some performance 
stuff, printing, file transfer, terminal emulation, 0.9.13 incubating introduced uh, CAS SSO support, um, screen recording, playback, connection failover, um, some terminal enhancements. Uh, ODA 9.14 uh, introduced um, OpenID Connect SSO support, so uh, Google, the, the uh, Google single sign-on, uh, I think was kind of the, the core target of that. Uh, SQL Server, JDBC SQL Server support, CAS ClearPass, the ClearPass extension to CAS authentication, and some other uh, history things and, and uh, stuff like that. 1.0.0 we released uh, very recently um, at the beginning of this year. Uh, adds user group support, asynchronous clipboard AT API, um, two-factor authentication, native two-factor two authentication, radius authentication, dev keys, um, uh, and, and some other stuff. Um, kind of looking forward as, as far as features that, that we're adding in the coming version, so we're working on 1.1.0 now. Um, the scope is finalized on that. We're just working toward driving the, the issues to completion. That will support the free RDP 2.0 library, which has been challenging to implement. Um, JLDAP API, so shifting from the legacy Novell Java LDAP API to the Apache, um, Apache Java LDAP API. Uh, Docker improvements and lots of bug fixes. 1.2.0 will support JDK 11 and clipboard control, uh, clipboard access control. And then kind of beyond that, we're looking at SAML authentication, web USB, XORG support, HA, uh, better HA configuration, session persistence, remote FX. Uh, we have lots of, lots of, lots of features on the, on the list of things we'd like to do um, within the project. Um, I probably should have reversed these slides. That, that gave you a history, but this, this kind of lays out what the individual components of Guacamole are. So there's, there's essentially a client and a server piece to Guacamole. I told you that the Guacamole is at its, at its core a protocol, and so there's a server side that, that serves that protocol and translates into the remote desktop protocols, and there's a client side that accesses that server. So GuacD, or Guacamole server, is written in C, um, and uh, does the translation between the Gu Guacamole protocol and RDP, SSH, Kubernetes, Telnet, VNC. Um, the Guacamole client is written in uh, a combination of Java, a, a Java application which runs in Tomcat or JBoss or what you know, pick your Java application server, and Angular JS which runs in the browser. And so um, the the Guacamole client piece of it, the, the piece that runs in Tomcat, talks to GuacD and and does the Guacamole protocol over that connection. And then the piece that runs in the client talks over either HTTP or WebSockets or HTTPS or secure WebSockets to the, the Tomcat application. So there's there's two major components, but almost really three components. There's the web the web application that runs in the browser, the the Java application, Java server application, and then the GuacD component on the back end. Um, and then the the client has a lot of extra bolt-ons and features and things like that. So there's kind of a core implementation of the client that does the actual display, the the components that actually display the, the remote desktop stuff in the browser. And then around that, there's a framework of components that do authentication and um, and you know the the presentation, the web interface that Brian will demonstrate that you'll see the, the menus and, and things like that. And then there are extensions that, that, that kind of go around that and bolt onto it. So um, the authentication is all done based, based on extensions and there's a common API that you can use to write an extension that does authentication in the way you want to do it and then um, tells the Guacamole client, I've authenticated this user, this user is okay. Um, and the current, uh, so I, I threw the, the current authentication modules up there that we support today. JDBC, LDAP, OpenID, CAS, RADIUS, TOTP, two-factor, um, DUO, two-factor, a basic HTTP header, and then Quick Connect is the little connection bar that lets you kind of enter a, a connection very quickly within the, within the web interface. Um, so th that's kind of a, a quick uh, view of, the, of the, each the components of Guacamole. Um, I don't have much other than that. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about it, but that's kind of, you know, th this is one piece of what Brian's going to present here in a second with the, the cloud in a box 
um, system that he has come up with, and, and guacamole is, is a component of that that, that, um, that he's going to show you. So any <coughs> questions for me, anything you want me to try to go over in a little more detail? Yes, sir. Uh, Ubuntu, when you go into Ubuntu Tor Ubuntu.com, they provide a very similar s solution where you can actually see the desktop. You don't need any plugins or anything. Is that similar to this, or is this much more advanced than the ones that? It's it's probably similar, but um, I would venture a guess that Ubuntu supports a single protocol to do that. That it's it's talking in a single protocol. Guacamole has supports five protocols today, five remote desktop protocols today. <coughs> With um, you know RDP, Kubernetes, VNC, SSH, and Telnet, and then we're also looking at adding Spice and um, Xorg, uh, an Xorg server in, in the future as well. So, so it, it's probably very similar, but it's um, the Guacamole just has some extra features in terms of authentication and other protocols that right. it supports. And so basically, you're converting the desktop into images, and then typically displaying it. Correct. Yes, it it it, uh, it converts. Yeah, the the takes the one protocol, the remote desktop protocol on one side, converts it to uh, it's either a PNG or JPEG, and it actually does some auto detection depending on the the link characteristics to determine the best um, image type to use and 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 how to optimize that, and converts that to images, and then takes the keystrokes and pushes them back the other way. Okay. All right. Um, I see that this can be used also for tunneling, and I know its purpose is pretty much a client RDP. Uh, so there's two questions that I have. Um, one, when I set up a standard RDP, one of the things I had the difficulty with is the back into the X server on on my Linux, and does it have so does it have a good model for gluing the the desktop um, stuff so that, that when you install it, it just naturally installs and it does all the work. Uh, so it's, that was problem one, but that's a kind of a trite question. The second question is, if I'm using it for tunneling, could I use SSS client certificates for authentication? Um, so, so for your first question, it doesn't really help you with setting up the remote desktop protocol itself. It, it is a gateway, it is a remote desktop okay, so gateway. So the first thing you do is so install RDP you, and then you put yeah. guacamole on top of it. Yeah, you've got you've to have your remote desktop protocol on the back end first and then you set up guacamole to talk to that. Um, to answer your second question, um, today we have not implemented an extension that does certificate-based authentication. However, um, there are two, you know, two routes I could see to do that. One is, is writing an extension that would do it. The other is that I believe CAS supports um, X509 certificate-based authentication. So you, if you set up CAS to do that SSO authentication for you with a certificate, you could then have Guacamole accept so the CAS does Guacamole authentication. plug into the pluggable authentication of Linux? Um, somebody has written a PAM module for it, but it is not part of the Guacamole project. So it, it does it does support CAS, but not not through PAM. And um, you could do the certificate through CAS, but uh, I think it's been suggested a couple times on the mailing list to implement a, a native certificate authentication. On I, I see at Google that people are using this to, you know, for connection instead of RDP. Yeah. You know. Well, it's and it's also I mean it, it is since it runs over HTTP and HTTPS, it is very much designed to be a internet-based way to tunnel into your systems. And however you need to do the authentication, it's designed to be flexible to, to, to work with that, you know, to securely authenticate your, your users into that sort of environment. Um, any other questions before I take Brian's cue on the connection management? So um, Brian mentioned connection management. So you know one of the things, and, and I'm sure he'll show this in, in the demo. I don't have any slides for it or anything to, uh, I don't actually have an installation up here right now. But um, what the Guacamole client allows you to do is, is kind of pre-set up connections. So it, it's really designed around an admin user sort of a, a, a model where you have somebody administering it that says these connections are going to be available to this host name and this you know, with these parameters to it, and then your users log in and access those connections. Um, and it's, I, I would say, similar to 
maybe uh, maybe some of the VDI solutions out there like Citrix, uh, Zen App and Zen Desktop, or uh, VMware Horizon View, where somebody's going to be defining the connections to the servers and, and how those look, and then you'll have a set of users that access those. So you can you can configure parameters for for those connections and pre-configure those connections so that when the users go to log in, all they have is a, a desktop that that shows you know these are the connections available to you. You click on the connection. You either get transparently authenticated into that connection, or you you know enter your credentials to authenticate to it, um, depending on how that configuration is is set up. So um, it, it is designed to to sort of be that admin user you know split that admin user um, uh, functionality there um, to to allow those things to be predefined for users. Other questions? Is there much progress on like supporting remote FX or other? Some of the advanced stuff out of RDP that's been. Um, there has not been much progress made on it. It's in, there is a, I think, so we use JIRA, the Apache Software Foundation uses JIRA to track issues. Um, so there is a JIRA issue out there in the Guacamole project for remote FX specifically. Um, nobody's had time to work on that recently, and right now we're trying to get uh, free RDP 2.0 support in into it, um, which is its own challenge just in general because of the way FreeRDP has split out their versions. But um, so there hasn't been much work done on it. It is on the roadmap somewhere, somewhere out there on the roadmap. Um, the, uh, I see the server is C, and I know Apache has a pendant for implementing a bunch of stuff in Java. Um, <laughs> is anybody working on WASM um, to um, make the client just transparently run in you know the uh, the Angular app just reaches out and ties into the um, to the protocol. Um, it seems like somebody had tried to do it in Electron or um, Node.js. Um, it seems like I had heard something on the mailing list at, at one point of, of someone trying to do that. Well, we can we now you can take you could take the library of the server apart and get the protocol stack from it and. Pull it into the Java code through WASM is what I was thinking. Okay, um, no, there's n not been any effort in that direction that I know of, but people have talked about doing, trying to do like a, because the front end is all written in Angular JS, trying to do a native Angular JS client that just talks directly to to GuacD to the the server component, <coughs> to, you know, to I do that without the standard Java stuff or anything, anything. Yeah. That, um, you know, the Java script looks at stuff has standard protocol stack for is what the problem is. Yeah, and, and it's just, it's really just, the, the JavaScript piece is talking over HTTP and HTTPS to the Java component, and then the Java component is what's doing the protocol to web translation there. So I, I got halfway expected people to start throwing things when I said it was written in Java because there, there seems to be a, you know, there's a, you, you either love Java or you hate Java, and there's not much in between, right, so. Is it, um, is it uh, TCP or UDP to do the actual packet? TCP. Okay. The, the protocol, the guacamole protocol, listens on port 4822, and it's a TCP, so it TCP is protocol. Yes. So it's, yeah. Somebody has solved some of our problems for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? Yes? So what kind of, you talked about <coughs> You talked about uh, how the, I guess the Java part is doing the, it, it, well, I don't know actually, is the Java part doing the uh, image processing to then push to the? Yeah, so the, the Java component takes the, the what it receives on from GuacD, the, the image data it receives from GuacD, and then, and then basically presents frames to the browser side of that. So it, it updates, it does frame updates, basically putting a, a PNG or a JPEG image out to the browser for each of the, the packets it receives over the, the GuacD protocol and GuacMoly protocol. Are there different levels of compression or varying levels of compression that will be? Yep, so yeah, today it, it auto detects. Um, so it, it looks at the looks at some characteristics of the link, the latency of the link, and the, the bandwidth that it, it can try to detect on that link, and makes a decision about what, um, 
what image format is going to be the, the most efficient for you know getting a good display but not you know hammering your processor or your your network link and tries to make that decision. Um, there were um, some, there was a request at one point for, uh, or a, a suggestion for a feature to allow that to be manually adjusted so that you could you know, kind of tweak the characteristics of, of those things and we haven't put that in at this point. So all of it is kind of auto-determined based on some criteria within the code today. What is the standard framework that you would get? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Maybe a dumb question. So, is there a support for uh, GPUs to be used for compression and everything associated with it? Not a dumb question. Also, has been suggested does not exist today. So, as you can probably see, there there are lots of like really good ideas that you guys have that that just haven't been implemented yet. Um, but we, we again, we have talked on the mailing list about you know, hey, it'd be really cool to try to take an NVIDIA, um, you know, NVIDIA grid. Uh, uh, GPU or something like that and try to have, uh, you know, GuacD do the, uh, particularly that remote desktop to guacamole protocol translation to do that processing on a GPU. Um, I don't have access to an NVIDIA grid <coughs> GPU, although uh, it's getting easier with Amazon supporting it. I just don't have the monthly budget to do that either. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, obviously prioritizing the, you know, the, the features that we implement and that kind of stuff that hasn't risen to the top yet. So. But it would be cool. It'd be cool to do a you know OpenGL spin the cube in the in the web browser sort of a thing. Would be would be really cool. So like Google then found out that there is a NAT traversal problem with guacamole <coughs> too. I mean, you have to resolve that problem or put your guacamole server on the real internet. So you can't you can't reach out beyond it's it's since it's session based. You have to make a connection. Yes, you, you do have to make the connection and you have to have the components in the right place or, or access between each of, the, each of the components in order to make that connection. Um, you know, we have a, a few sort of recommended ways of... So I'm not sure when you... One of your foil things led me to believe or, or infer that um, guacamole had somehow done some session initiation for you so that you could traverse the, uh, the the NAT on both sides and make that connection and uh, no uh, no you, you definitely have to have the 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 uh, TCP routing the I routing that has to be in place there between each of the components in order for and you you don't to have any reverse SSH kind of concept of uh, where if you could I guess it oh, ne never mind I, so SSH tunneling is also on the list yeah, uh, of, of things that, to do. That may have made me infer that you had. Uh, no. So S SSH tunneling is on the list of things to do. Um, I don't know if we'd support it forward or reverse or both, um, but that that's also come up as something that we want to try to do to to ease the the you know security and the tunneling between between the GUACD portion and the remote desktop portion. All right, then I'm going to turn it over to Brian. If everybody, everybody got their guacamole question that's answered, and maybe we can go out for Mexican afterward or something like that. <laughs>
My name's Brian Mullen. I'm retired from Cisco Systems. I spent 20 years there as uh, head of their broadband uh, advanced services consulting group. Been using uh, Linux since Slackware version one, uh, installed on a million floppy disks. Um, I uh, uh, gotten involved uh, some time ago uh, when I was still at Cisco with uh, a nonprofit, MCNC, who uh, some of you are probably aware of uh, their mission. And uh, I was given a Cisco fellowship to work over there and basically try and come up with ideas for them. So as part of uh, um, my job at uh, MCNC, I visited a lot of K through 12 schools around the state. Because uh, MCNC, for those that aren't aware, they run the NC Red Network, the North Carolina Regional Educational Network. But they also provide a lot of consulting, uh, wireless uh, networking in the schools, uh, just all kinds of activities. And I uh, traveled around with uh, some of their people to quite a few schools. And uh, I gradually I, I got to see what I guess I, I, probably everybody knows in their heart is schools are terribly underfunded. Uh, they don't have, it's rare that you find one that has any technical capabilities. Their uh, computer resources, and this was back in 2009, I think, uh, their computer resources were all over the map. They had old desktops, they had laptops, they had uh, just everything you could imagine. Some stuff didn't work, some stuff did. Most of it was on Windows, a lot of it, it was full of viruses, and uh, it was really a nightmare uh, for, the, for a lot of the schools I visited. They had. A lot of times, that for probably every uh, 10 computers that they had working, they probably had 20 that were sitting on carts someplace that needed somebody to fix something, clean a virus, whatever. So um, I came up with the concept of Cloud in a Box, or CIAB, I, call, I just came up with that name, but um, as an a initial concept to how to overcome some of these challenges. and. Um, the, uh, the idea be behind Cloud in a Box is I, I w was aware of guacamole. I knew that all you had to have was a web browser. So I figured, well, there solves one problem. As long as they had a computer that had a web browser, even if it had, didn't have anything else that worked on the computer, if I could give them a cloud server that had a desktop, they'd be able to get to the desktop and do something productive. The other concept that I, uh, uh, there were some other ideas that went along with this. I'd contacted a, a little USB manufacturer and uh, had gotten them to tell me about their process. And I learned that for like $3 a piece, we could get these little USBs ma custom manufactured. And uh, I actually, I demoed all this stuff back then, but we could put a, a ID on the little USB, and the idea was when a kid registers for school, the school could give them this little USB as part of the registration process. It didn't cost much, $3 uh, per kid. When they went in, they plug it into the computer. The software that I built at the time would check that that USB was there and that the ID matched uh, a login that was configured, and the kid would get his web browser log into the cloud server at the time I was using Amazon, and uh, uh, they'd get a desktop. Well, you know, most of the schools, as you know, are Windows-oriented, uh, some Mac-based, but uh, the idea was that the kids come into school in the morning, bell rings, they get on their de web browser, get in their desktop, the teacher could be there, they could do their stuff. Uh, at the end of the day, bell rings, they go home, they take their little USB with them when they get home, they plug it into their home computer if they had internet and a, a laptop or whatever at home. They could log right back into the exact same desktop, continue the work they were doing at school, 
and when they're done, they submit the stuff to the teacher because it's all on the same server um, out on Amazon. And uh, anyway, that was the idea. Well, the fellowship ended, and uh, I spent a couple more years at Cisco doing SDN. Um, then I retired, uh, and but I continued on the CIEB concept. Um, and today, uh, this uh, CIEB primarily consists of Guacamole 1.0, uh, Tomcat, MySQL, and Genix. I. In answer to his question about RDP on Linux, uh, I use XRDP, um, XRDP version 9 or 0 0.9.9, um, and that provides an RDP server. I picked RDP uh, over the VNC and some of the other options, mainly because, again, schools were primarily Windows, so if I used RDP on to get to a Linux desktop, Guacamole with its connection management, I could have a, one connection that gets you to your Linux desktop, another connection defined for a user, for a kid, that gets them to a Windows uh, desktop. They can have them both simultaneously, they can switch between them just with a couple <coughs> keystrokes, uh, but the idea there was to make it as flexible as I could. Also, uh, uh, I, I'm using Ubuntu, I, just what I've used forever, so I don't, you know, it's one of those things I don't switch. And uh, I use LXD uh, for Linux containers. Uh, for those that don't know anything about LXD, uh, Docker, and I know I'm simplifying this, but Docker is more process-oriented container technology. LXD is termed a system container. Um, well, I explained uh, why I picked RDP. These are some of the other reasons here. Um, I guess I should backtrack a little. Uh, the RDP traffic was encrypted. Uh, it has good com performance. It's widely used because of Microsoft uh, and everybody that deals with Microsoft. And it could be used to provide connections to Linux uh, via XRDP and uh, the Microsoft servers. Uh, the CIB architecture, this is a simple, simplized view, is any machine anywhere where the browser uh, accesses the the guacamole that's running in an LXD container on a server somewhere. And the demo tonight, uh, you'll all get a chance, you can log in, but uh, it's running in an LXD, one LXD container that I call CIB guac, but obviously anybody can call it anything they want. Um, that container is running Ubuntu as well, but LXD uh, can run uh, just probably a, a dozen or a couple dozen different Linux distros. So on my Ubuntu system server, I could run a, a Fedora LXD container, or a, a Sabion, Debian, uh, Alpine. Uh, there's lots of choices. It just depends on you know what floats your boat and for your use case. You may have an application that only runs or is built for Fedora. So you create an LXD Fedora container and, and uh, uh, get into the container, and, and once you're in the container, it's just like you're on a SSH session with any other server. You can configure whatever you want in Ubuntu, I app get, uh, or Debian, same thing. Uh, I won't go into a lot about LXD, because that's you know, it's like an endless conversation there. Uh, I also make use of free RDP uh, that Nick mentioned earlier. Uh, that's part of the uh, process of making the connection to the Linux server and XRDP. Um, the, some of the security benefits of, of CIEB, uh, the way I build it anyway, all of the LXD containers are unprivileged containers. Uh, for those that work in the container world, there's privileged containers and there's unprivileged. Privileged containers, the UID and GID or GID uh, in the container is this for root is the same as the UID GID for root in the host. In an unprivileged container, they're not. So in my system, if you log in to uh, a container and if you had root access, even if you were able to escape the container and you're logged in as root in the container, 
when you got out of the container, you would not be root in the host because the UID and GIDs are, are different. Uh, they're shifted. In my system, uh, there's minimal security exposure uh, to the internet. The only thing that's running in the host server, and tonight it's Amazon, is uh, the LXD daemon. And the only port that's open is 443. All the connections that come in uh, via HTTPS tonight uh, are passed via the LXD daemon. I, there's a command that we can set it up to, to uh, forward uh, any port in, from the host, any incoming traffic from the host on that port to a, any container, and you specify the port in the container and the what container. Um, and all the traffic uh, is encrypted with Let's Encrypt uh, certificate tonight. And as I mentioned, all the, uh, the two containers for the demo tonight are both unprivileged containers. And uh, in LXD, uh, the default uh, connection to the host is through a bridge called LXD BR0 is the default. And that's a private 10 dot network. <coughs> So from a security standpoint, um, you only have, HD, you only have uh, port 4 for 3 open on the host. Uh, I have SSH open tonight, just in case I have to get in and do something. But, uh, and then uh, the actual desktops and all the applications that you'll see tonight are all on the 10 dot network. So they're all isolated uh, from the internet. Everything in the containers can get out to the, net, to the internet. They can get to uh, Google, CNN, whatever. But you, you can't get directly into uh, the desktops or any of the applications unless you had the, admin, the guacamole administrator set up an account for you. If they're unprivileged, does that mean you have limited ability to write? No. No. So uh, well, uh, can it, access the file store. Well, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, okay. On the bottom here, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I already mentioned that LXD is uh, what's termed a systems container or a system container because it runs a full operating system. Uh, CIAB, uh, the initial install, it, it's there's just six scripts, and to install it on Amazon took me 20 minutes to install everything. Uh, that was the desktop, uh, the Guacamole, Tomcat, and Genix. MySQL, XRDB, et cetera, et cetera. Um, LXD also is uh, designed uh, to allow you to manage remote LXD servers as well. Uh, so if I had an LXD server on Amazon, which we do tonight, but it's, I've in the past I've had them on DigitalOcean as well and on Hetzner's cloud in Germany, and through uh, my one LXD through a configuration you obviously have to set up it's two statements on each machine but once you set that up you can manage any of those uh, from just the machine you're on so I could start a container on the cloud in Hetzner I could start one on DigitalOcean um, you could VPN all of them together and have them all on the same 10 dot network having the same DHCP and DNS um, LXD also supports clustering, and uh, for file systems, um, it supports a variety of file systems, ZFS, uh, BTRFS, LVM, uh, regular directory type file system, Ceph. Um, it, uh, with ZFS, BTRFS, you can do snapshot and restores uh, of containers. Um, there's a lot of capabilities to it. These are just some of the Linux distributions that you can create a LXD container with. Uh, so if you're on Debian, you could create a container of, of any of these that you wanted, and then you'd have uh, uh, Gen2 or whatever running as a container on Debian. <coughs> um, same thing on uh, um, Ubuntu, or a, a, pick any of these, you'd be able to have any of the others operating systems as a uh, container uh, to work with. Oh, this might be hard to see. Um, on uh, uh, CIB, there's uh, the remote desktop system, uh, and there's access uh, to it is just via HTML5 uh, web browser. Um, 
there's two in the default installation there's two LXD containers one's called C I just call it CIB guac that's where guacamole Tomcat Max QL and Genix run and you do the management stuff uh, usually the admin would be the the person that has access or the admins would have access to that connection. Then there's a CN1, uh, Container 1, uh, which tonight I've got a, a Mate desktop installed in it. And I've created 75 accounts. I didn't know how many people would be here, but uh, you'll all be able to log into this. Um, and um, then uh, uh, any, I have a set of about 25 applications, which I'll show you here in a second. Uh, that I've kind of picked and uh, built into a, a GUI on the uh, CIB GUAC container for the admin and they can, it's just a checkbox type thing, you pick any of them applications you want to install and uh, what it does is it creates another LXD container on the same 10 dot network, installs the application in that container and then uh, users they're logged into a desktop on the CN1 container, uh, can take their web browser on that container, point it to uh, that IP address, or if you set, there's obviously other ways you can set up with the host file, it's the host, uh, point it to that IP address and access that application again over that private 10 dot network. So uh, some of the applications, uh, I've got uh, a variety of categories that I picked. This was more, not so much for schools, but more for businesses. So there's sales and marketing, there's uh, social media, uh, applications development, back office stuff, um, uh, content management, uh, there's a lot of different categories here. I'll just run through these real quick, but uh, for application development, it's R Studio, so the R language for scientific and statistical work. Uh, Mantis is a bug tracker. Uh, New Builder 4 is a, a GUI based, I guess you kind of say, uh, like a basic uh, application development environment to build SQL applications. Uh, enterprise resource uh, planning, uh, ERP Next and Udo. Uh, and again, I'll just run through these because you'll have the slides. You can look at these later. Uh, the server tonight that I'm using on Amazon, I didn't know how many people would be here, so I probably overdid it, but uh, this, uh, I picked one that has 48 vCPU, and I think on Amazon, I could be wrong, but I think the vCPUs are uh, uh, 1.3 gig uh, gigahertz uh, per vCPU, so, uh, but I, a lot of RAM, <laughs> so again, I didn't want to be short, but I just, people that don't use Amazon, it, I just wanted them to see the kind of sizes you can go to, and the fact that I could have gotten even bigger, I could have went to 90, I think 96 or whatever it is now, BCPU. Um, but I, I picked this tonight because I wanted to be able to show that with a single server, you could host a lot of people. Uh, and with LXD, once, I've, once you've installed it once, and you have the CIB guac and CN1 container, you can copy that those two containers to another LXD server somewhere else, like in DigitalOcean, and not have to install it again. Or I could copy, copy CN1 over and over and over again and have more containers, and each one have different applications, have different desktop, uh, et cetera, in each one of those. And, and uh, with Guacamole, you just point the users, you'd give the users access to those additional connections. But again, it's $3 and uh, 45 cents an hour for this kind of a machine. You could probably have a couple hundred, I'm assuming, people. I think I saw another hand down there first, but I, I've got a question too. No, go ahead, because he just answered mine. Okay, so um, I didn't know much about LXD because I'm kind of a Docker enthusiast and I see it's complimentary but LXD is hosting an entire desktop or... No, it's hosting an entire operating system. Operating system. And it's just a, it's a container, so it's sharing the, ho the host's kernel. So that's in violation of a bunch of principles of the Docker container, like running one process... Right, right. And it all well, Docker doesn't have an init process, yeah, and, yeah. you know... So, um, but one of the 
basic principles of the container is immutability, so it doesn't appear LXD is immutable. It, it seems mutable. Well, you can reboot the LXD container and you don't lose any of your data uh, if, if that's the kind of thing you're looking at. Because you're in your LXD container, your storage is part of your container. That's why I was saying if, if I have, uh, if, if you've been doing a lot of work on an LXD container, like say this, the, the, the R uh, Studio container, say you're doing a bunch of uh, project work on that and somebody wants to have, they want to take their work and go somewhere else, you could copy that LXD container to some other system somewhere else and when it comes up, all their stuff's there, their data, their applica the application, and everything. That, that goes to the point you made earlier that, that Docker is very process driven. It, yeah. It's very much a. It's like an app. It's an app. It's like well, as a service versus it's, it's well matter of fact, you can run Docker in an LXD container. And, and Docker is designed to be very, very mutable. You, you do it once, you throw it away, you do it again, you throw it away, you do it again, you throw it away. Whereas LXD and OpenBSD. Yeah, solving like a different problem. Those are, yeah, targeted. Yeah. But it'll yeah. give you a graphical environment. Well, I, I used Docker for a while, but because it, it, it used to be based on LXC, but then they changed to their own uh, container technology. Uh, but uh, I know it was, may sound stupid, but it, it was just more complex than I needed. Uh, LXD was doing everything I wanted. I was already familiar with Linux. If I knew Linux, I could work with LXD, and it was just like working with any Linux server. I could log into it. I could install applications, I could create uh, uh, firewalls, I could do whatever I wanted to. Uh, IPv6, IPv4, um, you can create different networking, you, you can use, instead of using the LXD BR0 bridge, which is the default, which has its own DNS mask, etc., um, you could just create a regular Linux bridge, you could use VXLAN, you could use Mac VLAN, uh, you got all kinds of options with it. And, uh, and from a cloud perspective, although I don't have a slide about this, OpenStack's got a driver for LXD, so you can, you, you can cr instead of using a VM, a hardware VM, uh, for OpenStack node, you can use LXD container. Uh, Open Nebula, which I don't know if any you're familiar with that, but uh, that's sponsored by Etsy, the European uh, Telecommunications Standards Institute. Um, they have, uh, with their 5.8 release this spring, LXD is now a, now a first class hypervisor uh, in Open Nebula. Open Nebula to me, I used OpenStack quite a bit when I was at Cisco, but Open Nebula is quite a bit simpler than OpenStack, and it's got 5,000 uh, enterprise and service provider customers using it. Um, so um, there's lots of people out there using LXD, it's not all, it's, it doesn't have the mind share or the advertising that Docker does, but uh, it's, it's a pretty neat system to work with. And you can run it on ARM, uh, ARM devices. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So have you created an image just similar to that of Gen2, or have you created an image for your whole process rather than just uh, starting an LXD and then installing it, do you have an image that can be um, Well, LXD, uh, the LXD uh, team has a, a complete image server with all these uh, images, they're pre-built. So right. if you wanted to run Gen 2, it, the command would be uh, LXC space launch space Gen 2 right. colon some version of Gen 2 yeah. and then a name of a container and then within 30 seconds or so, you'd have a Gen 2 container running. Right. Then you'd, you'd get into the container with LXC, exec, uh, that container name, bash, or whatever your shell is, and then you're at the prompt. Uh, or you can install OpenSSH and SSH into it. Right. Uh, so, so my question was more towards, have you thought of bundling your Guacamole and CIAB and everything into an image and then putting it into a repository just like the one that they have? So that oh yeah, people can yeah. Download it. Yeah. They can directly download it. Because you can create it. You can you you. It's fairly simple to create your own LXD uh, image repository. I actually did that uh, last year and had it on DigitalOcean, and had uh, twenty or thirty applications, etc. 
on that that people could with from their LXD systems they could just launch that remote image on their local system and it, it just happened right. but I didn't want to keep paying for that <laughs> myself I don't have corporate sponsors I'm retired okay. uh, so maybe it doesn't go without saying because I got to ask the question how many or do all known cloud providers host LXD they don't need to uh, because you can get on any uh, well LXD comes in two 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 ways uh, it's either in your the repository of your distro if they have it um, or uh, you install on a cloud as platform as a service then yeah you can well that's what I did to, for tonight uh, I use the snap version of LXD obviously there's the flat pack and snap it, some people are awfully opinionated. I don't care. I use Flatpak too, but uh, LXD uh, is built with, uh, they have a snap version of it, and because uh, a lot of the developers also work for Canonical, um, but uh, snaps, as far as I know, snaps available for most distros, so if you've got a distro and you want to try LXD, you can install it with, you know, snap LXD, and uh, you'll have the LXD server running or daemon running, and at that point you do whatever you do with LXD. Uh, when you're done, if you want to get rid of it all, uh, just like with Flatpak, if you uh, remove the Snap LXD um, version of LXD, everything that you installed it doesn't you know it doesn't mess up your system when it's installing stuff like uh, using AppGet or something like that. Uh, to install app software on, on a normal Linux distro. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not familiar with LXD, but how does, um, is there a concern, so in, in your use case, where you have a whole bunch of students or something using, using the server, um, how do you manage uh, storage between uh, LXD, or between so virtual servers? Uh, between the different containers? Yeah, between the different containers. Well, when you inst when you first install LXD, there's an LXD init process you do, and and that's basically configuring LXD for that particular physical server or VM, if you put it on a VM, uh, let's say. And when you do that, uh, it, it's going to ask you a bunch of questions. You know, do you want this? Uh, do you want to create a storage? For this, yes, no. If you do, what kind of storage do you want? ZFS, BTRFS, you know, you name that. Uh, well, uh, yeah, well, that's a hard question. It's, yes. Uh, something else it'll do is say, say I've got, um, say, say I'm just using ext4 for my file system, and I've got LXD, which I am, and I've got LXD running. But if I wanted the LXD containers to use ZFS or BTFS, when you do that, uh, if, your, if your host's file system is of that type, then LXD doesn't have to do anything. But if it's not, like if I'm using ext4 and I want to create a container with ZFS for the file system in the container, uh, it creates a, a, loop back, a loop file system. Uh, and then it creates a ZF, ZFS file system within that. And as part of that process, it'll ask you, how big do you want to make this? 50 gigs, 10 gigs, 100 gigs, whatever. Um, so you can, you can be using uh, whatever file system LXD supports, uh, even if you're not running that file system. Um, can I keep going here? Uh, tonight, I, I created, uh, um, I don't think I created 100 user accounts. I think I created 75. But the login IDs are all CIAB 100 through 199. The passwords are matching, so it would be for CIAB 100, the, the <coughs> password would be Trilug 100. Uh, obviously, we'd have to have some kind of sanity here so people aren't double picking, but um, I don't, if you all want to try this, uh, you're more than welcome. You, you point your web browser to HTTPS, either www.ciab.ws, guacamole, or um, just CIB, you know, HTTPS, CIB.ws, guacamole, and uh, 
you'll get a login ID or a login prompt and you'll log in with one of those passwords and uh, the only connection that I've defined for these tonight is just the CN1 uh, container which the mate desktop is in and uh, and I can show you uh, some of that we can go through that in a second but uh, let's see what else here well this is just talking about me and Nick uh, well you could just like you could in a Linux system I mean, unless you prevent it what at the same time will it allow yeah, I mean, it's just like if you share your ID on the system, somebody could. Um, now, I'm not being innovative. Now, normally on my system, I use TOTP, uh, and Nick didn't go into that terribly, but uh, for instance, to uh, enable that in guacamole, it is the simplest thing in the world. You take the, the TOTP extension and you copy it to Etsy, guacamole slash extensions and restart the guacamole, the guacamole server and when it comes back up everybody that tries to log in will have to authenticate with two-factor uh, and I use uh, Google's authenticator but uh, you'll have that plus your login ID and password I didn't do that tonight because I obviously not everybody would have that available and I didn't want to hinder anybody but uh, on the slides that you guys get, this is the uh, Guacamole Apache project, LXD's uh, um, uh, URL, and then uh, my GitHub where I've got all my uh, scripts, uh, et cetera, is listed there as well. Now I'll kind of uh, do a quick log, well, Yeah, I thought I had already done that, but I guess you got it times out on you. <coughs> so this would be the typical login. Um, me, I'm using LastPass, but. Uh, this is what something that if you guys had more than one connection tonight, uh, say you had 20 connections, five Windows servers, you know, uh, 15 Linux servers, and you had connections enabled for you to access any of those via Guacamole, you'd see all those listed here. Uh, me, because I'm the admin, I have the CIB Guac container, so I can go do admin type stuff, and then the CN1 container. But I was going to show you uh, guacamole. Uh, this, sorry, my screen couldn't be bigger. But uh, in guacamole, uh, to manage it, um, this is uh, uh, the screen you'd see. And Nick, chime in anywhere where I'm stupid here, because I, obviously I don't know everything about guacamole. But uh, I, for me, it's, uh, I try and keep things simple. So I, first things I always do is go to connections, uh, create a new connection, and we'll just go look at the CN1 connection. So in CN1, I give it just the name CN1. I say it's the RDP protocol. Uh, said that there could be a maximum of 200 connections, and, and uh, uh, each user could have two. Uh, concurrent ones. The IP address uh, of the container, uh, the port 3389 for RDP. And again, this is an Ubuntu uh, machine that we're logging into. So, is it real quick where he's got the, where, where he is right now, the Guac username and Guac password? So those are, those are what are called parameter tokens Oops. in Guacamole. And 
basically what it does is it takes the, the username and the password that you authenticated with and passes that through to the remote connection. So um, there are many, many use cases for this. One of them is, is where you have, you know, if you have a, a large Microsoft environment where you're authenticating Guacamole to Active Directory and then logging into RDP sessions, you can pass that authentication all the way through so that you don't have to log in twice. And you can also get through NLA support, um, which requires that the, that the username and password be provided without actually compromising those details so you're not storing them in the database somewhere. All it's doing is taking that in-memory version of the username and password and passing it through. And there are several, it, it's in the documentation, but there are several other tokens that can be substituted in within the configuration that can, that can be passed through to those connections. And then uh, you define in your connection, you define what encryption you're going to use. I'm, I just use RDP. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't use all of these settings, so um, I won't cover all of them. Uh, you can go to the Guacamole website and look at it. Uh, question? Yeah. So um, in terms of the container protecting, unlike Docker, this is running a desktop, but it seems like when I've logged into your, your uh, CIAB, I open the terminal and I can look in the home directory and I can go to your root home directory and I can look in other terminal. Other well, you have all the same permissions you would have in Linux, any Linux, so the, unless somebody the prevents you from. Is how does containering, because I assume I can see all of those other home directories because they're all, you're all hosting, you're hosting the same container. container. In, in Everybody, all these user accounts are in one container. Okay. It's think of it. Think of the container as a Linux server. It's just like you're logged into a Debian or a Ubuntu or. So if they were hosted in like the public school scenario, you were doing each one of those containers was hosted separately. Well, my concept, my concept for the schools was. Unlike tonight, where I just have the CN1 container, I would initially create the CN1 container, but then I'd create, and I, maybe I'd call it, uh, uh, you know, grade one or whatever, first grade, and then and then copy that, which takes 60 seconds to clone it, uh, and then call the second container uh, but like, like grade Docker, two. Does it have an efficiency of the file system where everything is just copy and extension? Yeah. Well, with this, the efficiency comes in from the standpoint, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but uh, with this, if you were using ZFS or BTRFS, you got copy on write uh, capabilities to where uh, there is a lot of efficiency uh, with that in that you're, you're not, each container can share as much of the immutable part of the operating system as Yes, well, so Docker is immutable, so if it's a stack of, so you can keep making mods to a Docker container, and people can be using a base part of that container, mm -hmm. and they only get one copy because it's immutable. Yeah. But if you start mutating it, you've got, now with ZFS running it, you maybe not have a problem because it's copy on write, so you don't, you, you know. Yeah. But I don't know. LXD, so I don't know how they solve those problems. Well, like I said, when you think of LXD, think of it as just working with server or working with VM, except for without the hardware, the virtualization. Well, it is, about, it is pretty much the same. The only difference is you get, I think the measurements they've done is about 15 times the density. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so what's confusing me is the word container, though. Well, the operating system's contained. So the way LXD does containers is not like Docker where you're stacking. So Docker downloads the, the layers. Yeah. It downloads the layers and it stacks the layers and each container you create from that image only, as you point out, is a very efficient copy of, of that. It's only copying the parts that it needs to change. And when you destroy that, you go back to the original image. LXD does not work that way. Each LXD container has its own storage space. Now, if you run a file system underneath it, like ButterFS or, or ZFS, you can, you can create snapshots of yeah. those file systems and come up with that same efficiency that Docker has, but it's not built into LXD. It's 
not part of LIC by default. Yeah, well, not, not not only do I want the stack stacking efficiency of Docker, but I also want protection mo models so that one user can't see the other users. Well, I mean, if, like if if you want that in LXD, you'd do it like you would in Linux. You know, just change file permissions. Yeah. You know, you, I don't want somebody to look at my home directory, change the permissions where I'm the only one who can look at it. Yeah, give them well, their own container. I mean, that's, that's what, that's to me what containers meant is that, you know. We but you're, again, you're thinking in terms of processes, not of the, yeah. containing the whole that's operating right. so system. You're thinking in terms of, you're right. In terms of processes, but this is not a process. This is not a, a process. This is a complete thing. operating system. It has its own init. It uses it system D. Yeah, the, 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 the LXD is, from the container perspective, is basically sharing the kernel. The kernel is shared across all the containers that are running on that on that system on that machine, and everything else is separate. So it's not it's not the process level container where you've got a, a process in a container and you're sharing much more than that it's it's you're sharing the kernel and that's all you're sharing sorry to be a oh no no trust me trust me, trust me there are so many there are so many docker people that get confused because they're they're used to the docker concept and then they go to lxd and you just have to keep telling them it's just a linux server when you log into it you're drawn any just like any other linux server do whatever you do with the linux server right yes exactly so this is closer to virtualization it is, it is and and uh, and they call it a uh, canonical calls it a hypervisor, but uh, it kind of is in a way. Except for you don't have the hardware virtualization. All the hardware is in the host, and you can conf you can configure like if you want GPU pass through to the container, you can do that. It's there's a Linux uh, there's a LXD command to and to configure the container to use that. Uh, you can share. You can share if you have a, uh, an account in the host and in the container, and maybe you want to share a, a, a subdirectory in the host with your container. Uh, you can do that. Uh, but again, the as I've said, the the container they shift the UID UIDs and GIDs by. A, I think the default's a hundred thousand. Uh, so where uh, UID uh, zero or one or zero in the host might be a, a hundred thousand and a hundred thousand one in the container. So even if you were to escape the container, you're you're not root in the in the host. The recent uh, there was a recent uh, 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 well, it was with uh, Docker was affected, but um, there was an exploit that they had a month or so ago, uh, LXD wasn't affected by that because they, they, it's not, it's not, they don't do things the same way. Um, it sounds like though there is a, a, a subtle security hole in that you could try to initialize things and if it fails then you know it's not on that physical server, but if you can initialize it then you know that it is. I'm not sure. Well, you're I understand. About doing that init when you're that oh, each container, each yeah. container's got its own init and, and its own system D. Right. Uh, but is there something that? that oh well, the other the other thing. Allowed to the other it. thing is when I create a LXD container, yeah. um, it's an unprivileged container, but that container is my container. If you were to create one, you could create one with the very same name. Uh, You'd have control over it. You'd be root in that container. I wouldn't be. Uh, they're, they're right, but when you're doing that init thing, you said you could, you know, like go to uh, init a GPU or something. Well, okay, so it has to have some sort of thing that tells you whether that was successful or not, right? It is. It would tell you yeah. if it was your container. Right. So but it's not going to tell me if, if there is no GPU in that machine, it's not going to initialize it. No, 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 no. So you can discover by, you know, process of elimination what's well, you, in the actual machine. Well, you can do that on any server, right? Right, but, but uh, most servers aren't going to have the kind of, well, I guess, you know. The I mean, if I logged, in, if I logged into some stranger's Debian system, yeah, yeah, but, I could but, do the same thing and say, oh, well, he doesn't have any GPUs. But I'm thinking about like at a school or something, right? So you have all these bored kids sitting around, and they're going to, you know, try and figure out what's on the machine. For real, 
Well, again, you can you can secure the, the LXC commands to where only you as an admin can issue them too. Okay, so uh, so I mean, it's up to it's up to you. You're you're the to you'd be the admin, so yeah, but you, you do what you want to do with it. But basically, you could you can lock out certain things they might try to initialize that you might that you might want to keep them out. Of. Yeah. Well, like I said, you could, you the easiest thing to do is, any, any question, first thing is say, can I do this on a regular server? If you can do it on a regular server, you can probably do it in LXD. If you can prevent something on a regular server, you can probably do the same prevention in LXD. There's other things in addition, because it is a container that you can also right. do yeah, from the security standpoint. There's a standpoint. level of exposure, typically, on a real server. I'm going to expose it to 1,000 high school kids. Oops. <clears throat> but you're giving an, an example of the addressing uh, that might be used at a, at a school or the container names or something. I don't know what terminology you're using. So I'm going to get logged in to my own computer. No, I don't think caps lock's on. Yes, you access timeout? No. It's me probably being stupid. Oh, never mind. I was typing my password wrong. So never mind. Well, again, I don't want to go through all just all the LXD stuff because yeah, it's I it's a big it's a big topic, and I kind of want to just get to finished with the guacamole stuff. So on uh, guacamole on the config, uh, you can configure. Uh, there's different segments here for display, device redirection. Uh, the display supports different uh, capabilities as far as uh, resolution goes. Um, Let's see. Brian, what is the what is the password for each one of these? I didn't catch it. The, 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 um, you can try like really the same. Oh, uh, well, I'll, I'll do, go through that in a second again. Uh, device redirection. Now on printing, on guacamole, Nick talk to us if need be, but uh, uh, with most of the, most of these web browser based systems, uh, printing is one of the hardest challenges. I use Google Cloud Print. But uh, uh, using IPPS, uh, you can configure that. As, I found that you can configure that as well. Um, cloud, Google Cloud Prints, uh, easy to configure, and most modern printers support it. So you, you enable Cloud Print on the whatever printer, um, register it with Google's Cloud Print, and then on the desktop, uh, you configure a new printer and add Google. There's a plug in for Google Cloud Print and uh, for cups and then uh, you'll see that printer pop up or printers pop up you pick that whichever one you want to print to and then it'll print uh, to that uh, I don't know what else is in here there's I mean there's lots of options I don't use all these um, I just wanted to show you uh, in general the screen for users uh, here's a list of the users for tonight. Uh, if you were to create a new user, you'd give him a name, uh, put in a guacamole password for the user. Now that can be the same password that they're going to have on the Linux system or, or the Windows system. If uh, or uh, and again, I don't use LDAP, uh, but uh, that uh, guacamole does uh, support that. You can give it a, a bit of a profile, uh, 
whether you disable uh, logins, uh, you can have passwords expire. Uh, this is where you give permissions as far as whether they can administer the system, uh, create whether somebody can create new new users, etc. Uh, whether they can change their own password. How does batch user? Yeah, uh, well, that's. How did you create all of these? I did it the hard way because I'm, <laughs> I'm dumb. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's backed by a SQL, uh, yeah. a, a SQL database that is that has pretty decent documentation. I I think um, so. You can you can also just script it in SQL and just say go create this number of users. Um, the the password is auto generated if you leave it blank too. So what you know what we end up recommending a lot of times for especially if you're using LDAP, you create it in JDBC because it needs to be there for permissions assignment. But when you leave the password blank, it generates. Uh, its own, you know, random strong password in there that nobody ever sees, mm -hmm. and and so so you can't compromise the database login. You can't log in without a password, and then L, if you log in with LDAP with that same username, it, it stacks that authentication together so that that user is the user's permissions from the database are pulled in. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering because uh, you were talking about before they had you had the option to pass through the mm -hmm. password, and then there's no database that's saying this password goes to this password or something. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so the... In the case where you don't have the same password, what is, how is that? Yeah, so the so it's the password that gets used to log into the web interface. Whatever password is successful at logging you in is what's stored as the locked password token. So if you have, if for example, you're stacking LDAP and JDBC, JDBC to do the permissions management, and LDAP to do the actual authentication, the, you know, the LDAP authentication would succeed and the, the JDBC module would then apply the permissions for that matching username to the person who logged in, and the swap username and password would be the LDAP values, essentially, that, that were used to actually successfully log in. Now, Guacamole does provide uh, uh, these groups where you can define a group, like I define Trilog, and then uh, you can use this to manage an entire group at one time as far as permissions, et cetera, goes. Can you can. Nested? Yeah, that's what this parent group uh, is about. Yeah, so it does support nesting. Um, there are a couple uh, nuances of how it works in this version in 1.0.0 that we're actually working on fixing in the next release. So especially when you're using multiple authentication modules like LDAP with JDBC, there are some, some ways that you would expect it to work that it actually doesn't work today in, in this version. So when we release 1.1.0, we will fix the, some of those things so that it's a little more intuitive. The way it stacks those <coughs> modules and the permissions together is a little more intuitive. Um, I, I don't want to go in too far into the weeds with that, but it, it does support nesting. It does support um, the group permissions. So um, we're just trying to tweak that a little bit in the next version. But it looks like there's just two level nesting, parent and, and member. So we're like trying to do a whole school system or something. No. You can have you can you can do multiple layers of nesting. Okay. Um, well, why don't I don't know what time it is, but uh, why don't we just let you guys try this for a little bit? And, and uh, I mean, it's not it's a desktop, so you can just look around. You can run the browser on that desktop. Uh, one thing I use I try and do with a lot of remote, de and I've tried a lot of remote desktop systems, X2Go, uh, uh, our desktop, all kinds of systems. Um, Guacamole has, with the RDP has provided really good performance. Uh, this isn't something you would probably do in a sane fashion, but I one way to test the performance to me, for me, is I, I log into the remote desktop, I start its browser up, go to YouTube, and play a music video and just see how choppy the video or the audio is. Uh, with guacamole, it's actually pretty good. I looked around, you don't have any, I was looking for some music or video to play and there's not, nothing in there. No, nah, because I, again, I put <laughs> this up for, there, I put this up yesterday or day before for, to, in order to do a demo for you guys. So um, anyway, um, the address to get in is HTTPS, CIB, dot ws slash guacamole and I don't know how we want to do this but uh, why don't you take 101 you take 102 103 oh you're in 
103, uh, 104. You, you just put the list up there. Well, it's just, uh, okay. Well, it's, it's CI, the login ID is CIAB and then the number, so 101 to. Uh, yeah. It's probably random enough, we probably don't have to worry about it. And then the password is Trilug and that same number. So Trilug 101, Trilug whatever. Would you be able to show us the LX, the LXD architecture, like the way that you have set it up? Like, uh, yeah, I can do that. I'd have to. Um, all lower case, yeah, just TRI, LUG, and then whatever the same number is. But I think I've only got, no, I don't think so. But uh, uh, I only went up to 75, or 175. Uh, so it's like 101 to 175. So it sounds like you know a lot about containers, LXC and LXD. Um, do you happen to know the API? I heard a doctor a video about that you can't connect to it. And they said the reason LXC one was popular as a doctor is because they flatten the usage of it. Maybe APIs actually run Docker make the interface simpler with the managers together. But I went into a, like a Linux book well, if you want to see the API for LXD, go to linuxcontainers.org and go to the LXD section. And, and if you go to documentation, they have all the documentation. They've got the API. It's very extensive. There's more stuff than I'll probably ever learn. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Nick. Good to meet all of you. Appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you from my work manager, if I have QA and XD, it's going to create one more. Yeah. Uh, do I not have access if I'm just S oh, yeah, SSH? Oh. Uh, oh, well, I can do it another way. That is the biggest, hardest part I've been trying for the past four days. Oh, I was going to show you. Um, are you any of you logged into the desktop yet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if you bring up the web browser uh, in the desktop, the, the desktop's web browser. Uh, I've got a bunch of web applications. I told you I had web applications defined. These are a list of the web applications. So Drupal, Joomla, Nextcloud, ERP Next, uh, Modic, Mahara. Uh, ITOP, ITOP's a CMDB, ITSM, a uh, really nice system, RStudio, et cetera. To install, as the admin, to install any of these, you click, you just click on it, or click, and you can click on multiples at the same time. Ah, crap, I don't have a scroll bar here. Um, or I'd show you. But, um, uh, I could change the resolution. But anyway, there, at the bottom, there's a install button. Click install, and it would install any or all of them if you had. Well, it's only on the admins. Oh, it's only on the admins. Um, but for tonight, I just pre-installed several applications. So uh, I installed three or four of them. Uh, one was Drupal, one was uh, WordPress, and then RStudio for the R language. But uh, Brian and you probably that was Brian. Nick. Er, oh, okay. We, we didn't ask him, but how does Guacamole serve up through the browser all of the um, gesture, all of the interfaces of the desktop that you would normally have physically in a virtualization? Because there's a bunch of different ways of doing that. RDP does it different ways, and mm -hmm. you know, and that metaphor, those metaphors are always are. So I don't see any way to pop up the, you know, the quick, short-circuited menu for this desktop. Uh, where are those? Short-circuit menu. Well, right? I can, I can, I can double-click and get a menu to pop up, but I don't think it's like the control shift escape will bring up a sub-menu for the guacamole. So control control shift well, no. If you want to get the, if you if you want to get the guacamole menu, like say you had four or five connections active. 
uh, you do control alt and left left shift. It's the left control alt shift. That bring that brings up a pop up guacamole menu where you can pick a different connection or you know. Uh, so it's RTFM the guacamole. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, we can't cover everything tonight. Yeah, this no, is a, this is an awful lot of stuff that's yeah. been integrated over a long period of time. But uh, in my case, the the Mate desktop. I also have Budgie or XFCE as alternate desktops that my scripts will install if you want to use those instead. But um, um, in my case, I'm using XRDP is installed in the CN1 container. It's also installed in the CIB Guac container. And then when I create the connection in Guacamole, I tell it to use the RDP protocol and I give it the IP address of the container whatever container it is for that connection and it the guacamole the guac cd uh server uh handles the rdp uh communication with the xrdp in that container and passes that back to the uh guacamole client i.e your web browser um, like you didn't have a scroll bar i mean you know maybe it's expecting you have a touch screen Oh, well, it, matter of fact, well, you don't have a computer. But if you do the left control alt shift, uh, Guacamole does support um, touch devices like tablets and or phone. However, I, in my <laughs> use case, trying to do a desktop on a phone would be, <laughs> I don't have glasses thick enough to where I'd be able to see what I was doing. Um, it's pretty responsive. No, it's really good. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it's really good. Uh, like I said, to bring up a web brow the web browser there and go to YouTube and play a video, you don't have to play the audio, but uh, but if you did, the video and the audio is really pretty good. Uh, and that's a browser in a browser. And so, I've used X to Go a lot in the past, and X to Go's got great performance. Um, it's based on the NX protocol, but uh, it's not as good as this. Um, now, um, something else on your desktops, you'll see a thin client icon. Uh, if you want to download a file to your local machine, uh, say you created a uh, LibreOffice document here, and you want to download it to your laptop, uh, if you click on that uh, uh, thin client or thin client drives, there's uh, Guac CF or whatever it's called inside there click on that and there's a download folder you just copy you just cut and paste the the file you want to download into that and then guacamole will download it to your download directory in your local machine <laughs> so you can, um, you can by, by the way LibreOffice is crashing oh I, well I'm just so you know <laughs> it could <laughs> I don't know if I'm using anything latest and greatest with that. Right. So I just you and you install a new application that's going to put a new. It creates a new container, and the only thing in that container is going to be that application, whatever goes in that application. And now, I was going to tell you, to, if you wanted to. For that added to there. What's that? Does that add a session to the users? No, that the admin. See, the admin is the only one that can install those new apps, and then. The admin would go back because maybe not every, maybe you don't want everybody to have access to our studio or you don't want to have everybody have access to whatever. Uh, so you might just have maybe just have a you know you've defined multiple groups and certain users in certain groups. Maybe you have one group that you want to have like your uh, like just with like with schools where you have different containers could be for different grades. My concept for businesses, well, one container could be for sales, one container could be for marketing, one container could be for uh, development, uh, et cetera. And you'd have different users in each one, and you'd have different applications in each of those containers. So you might have uh, uh, statistical and uh, scientific math, et cetera, applications in the one for developers or scientists. Uh, so you could, you could section off your organization just by uh, using different containers and different user accounts. So if you install the application in a, uh, you, you install the application here, it goes on that private 10.network. So again, it's not accessible from the internet. You have to be logged into the desktop to be able to get to it. So one of the desktops is like the jump box to the. 
It, well, you'd have to be. It, well, it's it, they're on the same 10 dot network, so they're the only way you'd be able to get to it, you know, because 10 dot's not routable. Uh, but anyway, I was going to tell you that uh, uh, those other applications, if you wanted to see Drupal, bring up the web browser, and I put these in the host files, so you could just uh, for the web address you'd put uh, uh, HTTP. Uh, colon slash slash Drupal or CIAB dash Drupal, sorry, uh, or CIAB dash WordPress or uh, CIAB dash R Studio. Um, just the 20, first 25 accounts. I just set R Studio up for the first 25 uh, accounts uh, because R Studio you have to have a user account on the same uh, in the container um, for R Studio to work. I, the way it works. Uh, so I observe YouTube actually kind of dropping. It, well, it can be, but we're all on wireless in here. I don't know about the wireless environment in here. So can you say again I have to get to the application server? Yeah. Pardon me? Huh? Would you say again I have to get to the application? Well, if you want to get to Drupal, it'd be HTTP colon slash slash CIAB dash Drupal. Or dot Drupal, sorry, not dash. Right now, everything is running off of the, that, that uh, 48 virtual CPUs that you set up, right? Mm -hmm. okay. It's running in one container. Mm -hmm. But it's got 48 virtual CPUs in that one yeah, yeah, Right, 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 right. So that's more than enough for Should be. Here. Is it, is, uh, how is the load distributed across the uh, virtual CPUs? Does one user get a CPU or? No. Oh, okay. No, on, on Amazon, it's. It's just the server, just like you'd have 16 core. So this is just one server? Yeah, one server. That has a lot of CPUs? 48, one gigahertz CPUs, I guess. I don't know how Amazon Im actually implements it. But there was something you said about clustering that I wasn't clear on. Um, well, LXD supports clustering uh, in itself, where you can set up a cluster. Yeah. L you, there's a set of commands for LXD where you can set up a cluster of LXD and uh, just as in a lot of clustering technologies, uh, they'd nominate uh, the central node for the cluster. There's heartbeats between all the nodes. Uh, they can share, if you use Ceph or ZFS or BTRFS, they can all share the same storage. Uh, but could the physical servers in the cluster be globally distributed? Well, now, and still be I'm talking about LXD yeah. container cluster. These are all containers in a cluster. So, uh, matter of fact, uh, Stefan Graber, who's the lead uh, engineer for the LXD project, he just, uh, just yesterday, he put out a scaling LXD paper. And uh, he, in that paper, he had 10,000, I think it was 10,000 containers uh, running. Uh, he brought up 50, uh, 50 virtual mach machines or 50 Amazon servers and had 10,000 containers running on them. Um, and they, uh, and he was doing a variety of tests, some of which included clustering, and he showed the results. It's all out on the linuxcontainers.org. Uh, if, you, if you go to the forum, uh, he posted the, the information there, and you can read about what the results were. Um, and a couple of the other applications I had, like I said, is WordPress is uh, CIAB.WordPress uh, or CIAB.RStudio uh, would take you to the uh, R or RStudio if you happen to use R. Uh, RStudio. Is there a hyphen in RStudio? I don't, I, I can't remember. I just put that on there today, so it could, it could, I could have done that. Oh, I can't SSH into the server, so damn. Just cat etc hosts and you'll have the name. Yeah, and CN1, if, uh, assuming I put it in there, let me go look. I saw it in the host file. Uh, sorry, I saw our studio in the host file, but I can't go to the IP machine. Well, hold on a second. I can. Uh,
So the LXC list, oh, well, I guess I'm not. Damn. Oh, I'm in, not in the right. No, I'm still not in the right. second I just SSH to myself the same container so I'm gonna go okay now I'm in the host server on Amazon so if I do an LXC list there's the different containers uh, and their IP addresses when I configured LXD on this one I did not tell it to uh, implement it IPv6 I could have but I don't have a need for it and if I'd done any snapshots of any of the containers they'd show how many you had here um, now to get into any of the containers from the host where the LXD daemon is running I just say LXZ exec CN1 bash and I'm there so now I can uh, more slash Uh, CIB.rstudio and it's 1.3. Yeah, so unless I had that. I've tried typing in the thing. Oh. Uh, the IP is just not stated on it. Yeah. Well, like I said, I put RStudio uh, on today and I didn't spend a lot of time on it because it was like two, hour, or two hours before I was supposed to come here. My wife was having surgery and <laughs> had other things on my mind. Uh, where, where is the. Um, File transfer drop app supposed to deposit the file. I see that it transferred it, but it doesn't appear. In it transfers it, and then it'll transfer it. Uh, I don't know what what kind of a system are you using running on your laptop. Is it Red Hat or? Well, I so it'll transfer it to your download in in Linux. It'll transfer it to your download your your download directory in your under your home directory. I'm transferring it from my desktop. From, from the cloud desktop down to your... No, the other way. Oh, you want to go the other way? Uh, yeah, there is a way to do that. I don't it's remember. I don't, I don't, sorry, I can't remember all this stuff. I'm no, that's okay. getting it, too old. It, it appears to transfer it up to your cloud image, but it doesn't appear in any of the typical folders I've inspected in. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Because, again, there's so much stuff here with all the different... I, I was able to download it through my local box. Yeah, yeah. Downloading it is yeah. easy, and you can upload as well. I just don't remember work process because I don't do all this stuff. See, my my background, at least with all this stuff, has been more of an integrator and in learning how to integrate all this stuff. So um, I learned a lot about MySQL, Nginx, um, uh, Let's Encrypt. And Certificates, XRDP, I'm practically an expert in Pulse Audio. I know more about Pulse Audio than I ever want to know. Um, uh, the LXD containers, there's just a lot of stuff and there's a lot of moving parts. And a lot of times, that's what you got Google for. If you don't remember, you go back to your notes <laughs> that you took, hopefully, or you Google it. So, But uh, with LXD, there's a great uh, user form on linuxcontainers.org. Uh, the developers are on there every day answering questions. Um, I also on Reddit, there's a LXD subreddit, r slash LXD. I'm the moderator there. I try, I try not to make that a support forum, but I try and make that more for uh, people to post LXD projects. There's a lot of really interesting stuff going on with LXD if you go out there and take a look. Um, some of that uh, is uh, a lot of people doing a lot of really honest things. Uh, private cloud uh, design, uh, SDN, um, Open Nebula, the Open Nebula stuff with uh, their cloud. And they've got some of the largest clouds in the world on Open Nebula. You don't hear about it uh, as much as, as OpenStack, but uh, it's, it's a lot easier to install and it supports uh, uh, VMware's uh, ESXi, it supports you can have hybrid clouds with Open Nebula on Amazon, locally, 
DigitalOcean, I forget some of the other cloud, uh, Google, uh, Google Cloud, uh, but they have all that, all, is all built in. Um, they've got a lot of great storage capabilities, uh, support NetApp and, and other uh, large storage uh, provider uh, systems. So did you have any other questions? I, I don't know how good a job I did explaining all this stuff. But the LXD architecture of how all of these are connected, like. Oh, well, this. This is pretty much it. Well, there's actually a, a way to show the tree structure, but yeah. I don't remember the command. <laughs> but uh, right, let's see. Oh, I don't have that. I don't have LXC running here. It's just in the host. Right here. Well, it's going to show you. It's not going to show you what you expect because with LX with LXD, also you have the capabilities to apply profiles to containers. So you can apply a profile to a container and say, you as a container can only use one core. You can only have 128 megabytes of memory you can only have this much storage and then that'll set the profile for that container and it won't ever exceed that. Uh, you can set uh, CPU usage to where you can say it on a, as a percentage. You can't use, I'm going to create this container, I'm going to apply this profile to you and you can, all, you can never use more than 10% of the CPU power. So I don't have to necessarily limit it to one core. I could say you can use all the cores but you can't use more than 10% of the CPU of the system. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, uh, a lot more than I've ever looked at, uh, but there's a lot of people that make use of that stuff that uh, I don't always understand myself. Where do you see this going in the future? Uh, what? This oh, this? In a box I've got a lot of, it's, it's kind of interesting, I've had a lot of uh, people uh, implement this. One was uh, a guy in uh, Western Canada who manages the largest um, uh, largest wind power system in Canada, and he wa he wanted to implement it because a lot of his wind turbines are spread over vast areas, and so he wanted to set it up to where he could just remote in to the different systems without having to getting a Jeep and drive out to God knows where. Um, and he didn't have to have a really complicated setup. So he had guacamole enabled him to have one place to manage it all. And then he could just have, create connections to whichever site he needed to go do something with. There's a group of guys down in, uh, uh, I think it's Guatemala or Uruguay, I can't remember, that they implemented for schools. I don't know what all they did. Because again, it's the source files are out there. They can do whatever they want with it. But uh, they implement it for schools. But they like the the basic concept because down there, they're lucky to have PCs and they're lucky to have internet. And this was just a way where, with minimum costs, they could give as many kids as they as possible um, a desktop. And and another nice thing that I didn't mention on this is like with schools. A lot of the schools that I saw, they were using Pentium PCs and God knows what. Some of them didn't have much horsepower. They had slow hard disk, you know, 54 RPM, uh, 5400 RPM disk drives, uh, et cetera. Well, by putting the desktop out on Amazon's cloud, I can give them uh, 92 core and, and SSD drives and you know, Amazon, this server, I think, has 20 gig uh, uh, networking links. Uh, so it didn't matter what the schools had, or what, like down there, it doesn't matter what they have. As long as they can get to the internet with a web browser, they had all the capability they could use. All they were getting was the desktop. And where I thought you were going with that little $2 USB stick thing was that um, they would plug that in and that would just take over the, the machine. No. It would, it would just no, I wanted something to where you had to have that or you weren't going to get in. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. But, but along the lines of really virtualizing the machine, I thought it would sort of turn it into a thin client that was... Oh, you could, you could do that. You could, you could do that. You could have it a bootable USB and 
with Chrome on it, and and, and have that and have them t have as soon as it boots off the USB, have it take them right to the cloud. Yeah. So if they have you know Windows or viruses or whatever, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does anybody run Raspbian? What? Does, does anybody run Raspbian? Raspbian? Yeah, there's actually a guy in Vancouver. Code what? Code school. How are they doing the code school? Oh, no, I, no, I don't know about that. But I just met a guy uh, who <laughs> has a background similar to mine. He worked for uh, uh, several networking companies, and he's retired now too, but he lives in Vancouver. And uh, all he experiments with is... is uh, um, Raspberry, the Pi environment. So one, he actually had, two, it, if you go to the LXD subreddit, I put links to two of his things there. One is uh, his work with LXD on w, open WRT, and the other is uh, he, he had an article that really intrigued me, and that's what where I first uh, read about. But he does a great job writing it up. But another one, his other one was uh, uh, creating a mini cloud of Pi's. Um, Using LXD, and um, he, he did a good write-up, and it's, it's really knowledgeable guy. I'm trying to get to know him, but he's headed off to Paris, so he's going to be gone for a while. But we're going to hook up when he gets back. Uh, any any other questions? How do things differ a lot from there's an older project called the Linux Terminal Server. Project. What's that? Are you familiar with that Linux Terminal Server project? That was yeah, LTSP. Yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, Stefan Graber, who's the head of the LXD project, uh, was part of that team. I don't know. How, is that still yeah, active? I was still kind of depreciated. So yeah, I kind of. Yeah. This is a bit like we tried to do 20 years ago. The network. Well, I, I built this because there's so much stuff going on with the cloud anymore. And it, whether you use it yourself or use it as a team or whatever, uh, as I said, the only hard part I found was trying to figure out how to do printing because uh, was it W3C the uh, defines HTTP and all that. They've never defined anything for doing uh, printing over HTTP, HTTPS or HTTP. Um, that I, from what I understand, I talked to Nick about this. He said, "Yeah, if they would just do that, it would really make this environment uh, uh, really great because then you." You'd be able to overcome because they pretty much figured out how to do everything else, file transfers and and uh, everything else. But uh, the printing, that's where the Google Cloud Print or uh, IPPS. Uh, I've learned a lot about that lately. Um, that's the approach that uh, is being proposed for universal printing without having to have drivers. But it kind of. If, uh, from what I understand, it converts everything to PDF and then prints the PDF, uh, transfers the PDF and prints the PDF. So, uh. All right. Do you know how, how well this, like if, if, let's say you're on a really old computer and for some reason they can't get a modern browser, browser on an old computer, um, how well it uh, transfers to uh, IE something? Well, you'd have... How well, Internet Explorer, like a, like old Internet Explorer, will this run? Will Guacamole? Well, it has uh, Guacamole has oh, to okay. has to support the HTML5. Uh, so if it's any browser to support that, like I've done, I've connected with this with my cell phone, but I can't see crap because it's <laughs> so so little real estate. And, but if you were to use Guacamole just on its own, yeah. you could create applications certainly that y you can make use of. And Guacamole does support uh, it, on the if you go to the website, they go through a whole section of the finger movements and what you can do two taps, three taps, what they can what they do or mean as far as the interface goes. Did somebody say the slides were on the meeting agenda? No. Oh, we ran away. Oh, no, there you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, if not, will we? Okay. Well, thank well, you for all for the opportunity. Uh, I didn't know how interesting you guys would find this stuff, but it's, it's just, I think it's got a lot of uses. 
and uh, obviously if you had smarter people than me, you could do a lot more with it than <laughs> I've done. Uh, as I said, uh, you can run Docker in LXD containers, so if you have Docker stuff, you can you can still make use. Of, you could create a container and, and uh, inst install some Docker. Uh, you create uh, LXD does support nesting, so you can have a LXD container turn, uh, configured for nesting nesting support, and then create LXD containers inside that. Or if you're going to put Docker inside an LXD container, you'd have to enable nesting for that LXD container in order to install Docker or a Docker application inside of it. Um, but again, the easiest thing with LXD is just think of it as a Linux server. If, if you create a CentOS um, LXD container, it's a CentOS server that you're working with. Uh, and 98% of the what you do in a physical server would be what you can do in that container. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it.